all of you. We are honored by the presence of one of the greatest presidents the Philippines has ever had, my mentor in politics, and that's uh, former President Fidel V. Ramos. Thank you, Mr. President. And of course, uh, the issue of climate change would not have been brought to national attention were it not for Senator Sonny Alvarez, who served uh, two terms in the Senate and longer in Congress as well. And he, while I was still a young journalist, advocated for climate change adaptation and mitigation when it was not yet a popular cause. So, Sonny, thank you for having us here. And of course, his very talented and creative and hardworking, uh, equally passionate wife, Cecile, uh, again, a, a champion of culture and climate as well. Um, attorney Joey Lina, former senator, uh, again, they were way ahead of me and he championed uh, local government as well. Now, very successful still in the private sector. We welcome all our uh, foreign guests representing the various agencies of the United Nations and other ASEAN countries as well. And our friends and colleagues uh, in government, uh, the Deaf Ed is represented, the DNR, local governments are also here. Uh, we're happy that there's three-day conference will actually prepare the roadmap on post-Paris uh, Accord. Because as we say, the time for talk is over and we are supposed to operationalize what the Paris Agreement really means to all of us. Our vulnerability to climate change impacts has always been highlighted in various reports and statistics. It is nothing new. All of us in this room understand the same language and know the same numbers. In the yearly rankings of countries, we are always in the top three, top five, depending on which survey of those most at risk of climate change. In fact, our vulnerability has been our negotiating factor in climate talks as what happened when we, together with other members of the Climate Vulnerable Forum, or the CVF, led the successful push to enshrine the tougher warming limit of 1.5 degrees Celsius in the Paris Agreement. Senator Sunny is correct in saying that we've already breached the 1% degree Celsius. And with a 1.5 to 2.5 degrees Celsius rise in temperature, one third of our flora and fauna or biodiversity in the world will be at the risk of extinction. Imagine our 113 protected areas. The NEPAS law was enacted by Senator Joe Elina and Senator Sani Alvarez in 1992, when I was still a young journalist and they were in the Senate. And that NEPAS law declaring 113 protected areas, both terrestrial and marine, have recently been enacted by new legislation expanding it. That was a very important piece of legislation which my two uh, colleagues in the Senate had initiated when they were young senators then. The Philippines' accession to the agreement sent a strong signal of our continuing commitment to work with the rest of the world in ensuring the survival of this generation and the generations to come and the ability of our Earth to sustain life. As early as uh, the few first few months of the Duterte administration, there were concerns that perhaps the new government would not ratify the agreement. I never doubted for a moment that indeed ratification would come full circle. With President Ramos being the advisor of President Duterte, and with yours truly being the chair of the Climate Change Committee, and the economic managers like Secretary Pernia, Secretary Jokno, and even Secretary Dominguez, understanding the importance of sustainable development and climate change mitigation and adaptation. And with the Philippine government climate tagging the national budget, I have no doubt that in time, the president would actually ratify the agreement. And I'm happy to note that in one day, simply by holding one session, a committee hearing, sponsoring it on the same day, with unanimous concurrence in the ratification of the Philippine Senate, we were able to concur in the ratification. And I think that really proves that with political will and sheer grit and guts, we are able to convert what seemed to be an impossibility to a reality. But even as we, thank you.
Even if the Paris Agreement has been hailed by many as a landmark agreement, its aspirations will not happen on its own. In short, people think it's a quick fix. Ink on paper, that's what it's going to be. If you don't have a roadmap on what the Deaf Ed must do, on what the DNR must do, on what the Climate Change Commission would do, on what the Department of Agriculture would do, on what local governments must do, on what all nations, big or small, emitter or non-emitter, must do. Effective enforcement emanates from everyone's understanding and appreciation of responsibility and accountability. All of us here today know that this treaty offers. We have our own inputs, how we can make it work for our country. It was mentioned earlier, something as simple as painting a light colored roof. It can be as simple as having vegetable gardens in our backyard. It can be as simple as segregating waste at source, recycling, and composting. It can be as simple as following the 1989 law during the time of Joey and Sunny of having the rainwater catchment in every barangay, in every home. It can be as simple as not using this quite expensive and useless lights and retrofitting it. Maybe it's LED, right? Because Joey is, it is LED. Okay, or even changing the temperature to 25 degrees so it's not too cold and not too expensive. So these are little doable things we could do every day. Often, we need to present the risk so people would actually understand the need to take immediate action. It was mentioned earlier by Sunny, the vulnerable nations, whether it's Maldives or Nepal or all the small island states in the Pacific. Vanuatu was also mentioned, Kiribati as well. We don't even have to look too far because even in the Philippines, we are already endangered. In fact, more than 60 provinces would be at risk of being flooded with the increase in sea level. So sea level rise threatens to submerge our coastal towns we don't even have to look into the future because it's already happening in Metro Manila and other provinces in Luzon, the Visayas, and even Mindanao. At risk are 64 coastal provinces, 822 coastal municipalities, 25 major coastal cities. This would result in the relocation of approximately 13.6 million people of our 100 million population. And I think this is even a very conservative estimate. Ocean acidification is causing irreversible damage to our coral reefs. We have global warming of up to 2 degrees Celsius. 98% of coral reefs will die by 2050. In fact, in the Philippines, we are at the center of the center of biodiversity, one of the mega diverse countries in the world with so many species in, in our marine ecosystem, but less than 1% of our marine ecosystem is in excellent condition. A World Bank study shows that this would cause a decrease in marine fish capture by about 50% by 2050 in southern Philippines. Moreover, sudden shifts from hot temperature to incessant rains pose uncertainties to agriculture, which would bear losses of 26 billion pesos per year through 2050 due to the impact of climate change. Extreme rainfall and heat, heavy floods, constant changes in weather, all of these pose great threat to our lives, to health, to livelihood. And we don't even have to look far into the future because we've already experienced it, whether it's on Doi in 2009, Sendong in Cagayan de Oro, Pablo in Region 11, or Habaga Trades, or just recently, a few months ago, in Cagayan de Oro. So all of these are affecting our daily lives. Food prices will increase by 50%. About 1.4 million more Filipinos will go hungry by 2030, and 2.5 million more in 2050. Again, these are very conservative estimates. Socioeconomic losses will impede growth with projected 6% GDP loss annually by 2100. You can say we won't be around by then. 
but this is not the way to deal with the present and the future. We bear the brunt of climate change, even if we are among those who contributed the least to the crisis. Yes, we are one third of one percent emitter in the world, but we are the third most vulnerable to climate change impacts in the world as well. And this does not mean, however, that we would always be victims. We can transform this vulnerability into an opportunity. We have proven many times that we have the capability to lead. When we enacted the climate change law, which is, has been hailed by the United Nations, one of model legislation in the world, many countries had asked us for copies of our legislation and are creating their own climate change action plan as well. When we started climate tagging our budget a few years ago, our national expenditures are now climate tagged, and I think this stands improvement because we can be stricter in our standards of climate expenditures as well. When we led the CBF in its creation a few years ago with Maldives and the Troika of the Climate Vulnerable Forum, we showed that our vulnerability need not be a disadvantage to us. And we spearheaded, the Philippines was one of them, to create the V20, or the Ministers of Finance of the Vulnerable Nations, which seeks to address climate change more assertively through innovative financing and technology, among many initiatives. And even at the local level, closer to home, there are communities, local governments, that have their own climate adaptation initiatives. Last year, the Climate Change Commission initiated the Climate Adaptive and Disaster Resilient Awards for cities and municipalities to encourage LGUs to do their own doable climate action plans. Ten local governments were awarded for implementing innovative strategies to manage climate and disaster risks in line with environmental laws already existing in the Philippines. And I'm proud to mention the environmental laws I authored in my third term. Mr. President, siguro po ay hindi kayo nagkamari sa pag-endorso sa akin bilang senador noong 1998. Dahil mula pa noon, ang mga nasagawa ko po environmental laws ay Clean Air Act of 1999, 2001 Ecological Solid Waste Management Law, 2003 Clean Water Act, 2008 Renewable Energy Law, Environmental Education Awareness Act, 2009 Climate Change Act, 2011 People's Survival Fund, apart from laws in other sectors as well. So, the Solid Waste Management Law is modeled in many LGUs, including the city or the municipality of Carmona. I was just there last week with Congressman Roy Loyola and saw the model ecology center that Carmona is doing. There is a barangay in Metro Manila, Barangay Potrero in Malabon, where I was born. We have informal settlers, we have garbage dumps, and these were an eyesore and really affecting the health of our people. But now, it's a model LGU in Barangay, and it has been awarded by the MMDA as a model barangay in the Clean and Green program. Let's say Barangay Nyogan in Tagaytay City as well is a model municipality and model um, barangay. So this can be done, San Fernando City as well. In short, 25% of our LGUs are actually compliant with RA 9003. So I ask if this is possible in one barangay or in one city and municipality, why can't it be done by others? Dr. Paraypay is here. I saw him earlier. He was one of those who helped me in my first term to create the ESWM. And so, aside from this, LGUs have also been distributing LED lights. The mere conversion or retrofitting of barangay and municipal lights to LED will already make us energy efficient. In 2012 and in 2015, LGU uh, halls, uh, officers, etc., have converted street lights within their areas to LED, and this continues through programs of the DOE. In Mindanao, in Hinatuan, 
Surigao del Sur. This is always mentioned because it's an area that is often visited by natural hazards and typhoons. Hinatuan was a CLAD awardee in Mindanao. The LGU's health programs include the prevention and the monitoring of climate-sensitive diseases. They carry out anti-dengue campaigns and they monitor many diseases and these are related to climate change impacts as well. You would ask, what does vaccinations have to do with this? What do senior citizens' pneumonia vaccination have to do with this? But these are impacts of climate change and these are actually proactive measures being undertaken by the local governments. The LGUs also have adopted the Isang Litrong Liwanag program. This was a cloud awardee which uses homemade solar bulbs as intervention to conserve energy. Aside from providing cheap light source for unventilated low-cost residential homes, it promotes recycling since the light bulbs are made from empty plastic bottles. In Dumangas, in Iloilo, for example, again, one of the CLAB awardees in the Visayas, they've set up a climate field school. I think that uh, another climate field school is found in uh, Del Carmen, in Surigao, which is one of the beneficiaries of the People's Survival Fund. So there are many of these climate field schools in Dumangas in Iloilo, since palay and milkfish production are the backbone of the municipality's economy, they needed to address these concerns brought about by climate change impacts to the farming or the agriculture and the fishery sector. This initiative ensures that farmers and fisher folks have strategies to cope with climate variability affecting the crops and the fish yield. The method used in teaching is participatory in nature, which plays a crucial role in implementing the program. So we see that climate change is really a complex issue, but it's also something very doable, which can be found in our local governments. So these initiatives show that we can all do our part, no matter how small or vulnerable we actually are. Now that we are already a party to the Paris Agreement, we need to ensure that we are able to determine our path towards sustainable, low carbon development through our MDCs or a nationally determined contributions that are transformational and ambitious. What are the things we need to do? First, we need to create the sectoral roadmap, such as the energy, transport, and agriculture sector. And I hope one of the outcome of this three-day conference would be to help, to help us identify what are the way forward and the doable things in these sectors I mentioned. The budget of local governments and of government agencies should support our NDC goals. Third, all government projects, including those foreign funded, must be aligned with the agreement as well as with other international frameworks for development, such as the Sustainable Development Goals. Earlier, President Ramos gave me his small uh, pocket size uh, calling card with the SDGs and the same that Sendai framework for action as well. If we are guided by both the SDGs of the UN and the Sendai framework for action in our government planning, we can't go wrong. LGU should also carry out climate resilience initiatives and access the People's Survival Fund. We have two billion pesos in the PSF. And I'd like every government agency and people's organization and NGO to know this so that your initiatives in the local level can be funded and can be assisted by government. Off-grid local communities should leapfrog to the use of clean and renewable energy. We must find out the solution to cooperatives or distribution utilities which have not transitioned to clean energy. There is this anomaly, I would like to call it an anomaly, and I was telling Sunny about it, where co-ops, some of them at least, prefer expensive, dirty fuel when there is available, cheaper, inexpensive, clean energy. That indeed is an anomaly which a DOE and the NEA should investigate so that these sources of energy 
can transition immediately to renewable. The Climate Change uh, Commission should also promote an energy efficiency rating system for residences and business establishments and carbon offsetting and initiate capacity development in strengthening understanding of climate change and disaster risk for resilient and sustainable development planning. We should also complete the local climate action plans of all our local governments because we already have our clubs, our comprehensive land use plans, and all we need to do is to enhance it so that our local governments would have the roadmap towards a clean energy local economy. So it is important that the Philippines continues to champion all of these measures, both international, national, and domestic, and local action. We must champion climate justice for the vulnerable of our country. We must monitor the implementation of the Paris Agreement, not just in the Philippines, but in ASEAN countries as well, and in the industrialized nations, which has cost most of it. We must operationalize climate finance for mitigation, adaptation, loss and damage, technology transfer, and capacity building. The Green Climate Fund has $10 billion. We must access that, and there will be $100 billion by 2020, yearly, at least supposed to be. So, if there is one important thing we should all realize as we move towards the implementation of the Paris Agreement, it is that our vulnerability presents so many opportunities for green, sustainable, and resilient development. The uncertainty of our future due to climate change impacts should make us even more aggressive to take the necessary action now. We are called upon to pursue a development path consistent with a 1.5 degrees Celsius goal to protect our people and to protect our environment. We are challenged to do more, to do better, and to be more innovative. We cannot forever say that we are vulnerable. Let us not just live with the risks, we have to deal with it. And we have to ensure that the present and the future generation will be living in a clean, healthy, and resilient planet. Thank you very much and good morning. Thank you very much.